Oh my goodness, Travis is a mess. Everybody say thank you, Travis. Thank you, Travis. Good fun. Looking forward to Easter. And by the way, Easter starts for us on Thursday. So you have the ones you're inviting. If you're on spring break, on Easter weekend, you got Thursday. Then, of course, all weekend going to be awesome. Now, I get to teach. It scared you, didn't it? I can <laughs> better listen to me. I get the opportunity to teach this weekend and the weekend after Easter. So it's a twofer. And this twofer is sort of a connected series centered on Hebrews chapter 11. It's a subject that we probably should talk about every two weeks, every two months, all the time through the year, because at its core, it answers the most practical of questions, which is how do you get a rewarding life? Now, we all want a rewarding life, but how do you actually get a rewarding life? Or maybe for that matter, we should just pause and talk about, well, what do you think is a rewarding life? Like, what do you wish for? What, 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 what would you chase? What are the elements for rewarding life? So I, I put some examples together. Happiness, achieve it and maintain it. Here's one, have dinner with Travis Billman. See, that for a lot of people would be happiness. Uh, find freedom, conquer my past, my bad habits. Work life balance. Go to heaven, yeah, of course. A whole and happy marriage, wouldn't that be awesome? Raise spiritually healthy kids, of course, and all that goes with that. Earn a degree. Maybe it's for you job and, and financial success, and that's all part of rewarding life. Maybe it's own my own house. Make a difference or be healthy and fit. See, we can go on and on. And do you know what everything in that list has in common? Hang on. When I went through that list, you know what they all have in common? It's not easy. Huh? It's not easy to get. You don't, listen, you don't get that list on easy street. You get that list on the hard road. On the what road, everybody? The hard road. We all know that. Like, in other words, you have to do hard things consistently. You have to persevere. You have to persevere. You have to what? Say it with me, everybody. You have to what? Persevere. Of course you do. We all sort of know that that's part of the deal. Sure, it would be nice. If you could get all you want in a rewarding life on easy street, it would be awesome if you just have to drop a dollar and win the lotto. Some of you have been praying that, <laughs> taking your favorite verse numbers. <laughs> By the way, what are your chances of that working for you? A one in a million. No, it's worse. I looked it up for you. You're welcome. You know what the actual stat is? Your chance of winning the lotto, one in 292 million. In other words, ain't going to happen. In other words, you're going to have to earn the old-fashioned way. You're going to have to persevere in work. So let's just put it on the screen. How do you get a rewarding life? A fair question. How do you get a rewarding life? stick to -itiveness. You can say it a lot of ways. I just like that word. It's a noun. It's a real word. Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Stick to itiveness. You got to stick to stuff. And you want a rewarding life, you're, you're going to have to stick to stuff. The good stuff, the important stuff. You have to persevere. You're going to have to do hard things. You're going to have to stick to doing wise, good, right, smart, healthy, godly things. You're, you're going to have to... We know this. You're going to have to stick to it even when it's hard. Even when you don't feel like it. Even when it's unpopular. Even when you feel persecuted. Even when you're weary. Even when it's boring. Even when it doesn't look like it's bringing a return yet. Perseverance. That kind of persevering endurance. That is what Jesus modeled. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about 
what Jesus did and how it ought to mark our lives and our path. Look at the scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that let us run with perseverance. There it is again. Everybody say it with me. Let us run with what? Perseverance. And now with passion. Ready? Run with what? Perseverance. The race marked out for us. In other words, you got a race marked out for you. God has a rewarding life on the other end. Now you run with perseverance. You go after it. You're going to have to endure. It's going to cost. It's going to be demanding. Of course it is. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. In other words, don't let all the distractions get you off the path. Don't quit being faithful to the things you're called to. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, what was the joy? The reward. The reward of a restored relationship with us to the living God. So for the joy set before him, and Pastor Jason's going to pick up on that next week. This is an Easter passage. For the joy set before him, he endured. There it is again. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Huh. The very thing that Jesus did, the thing that he modeled, the thing that he lived, is required of us. Consider how he endured. That scripture goes on to say. Don't even become weary. See, Jesus persevered on the hard road of the cross. And you will have to persevere. I will have to persevere. So that we can know the rewarding walk with God. Have the reward, the best of life, the most rewarding life on earth. And of course, all of eternity. Which we don't earn. He gives to us. But then he calls us to walk with him. See, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about Christ, the cross, Easter, and says persevere. Chapter 10, two chapters before, talks about Christ, the sacrifice, what he endured, and to persevere. And then chapter 11, right in the middle, gives this whole list of people who walked by faith ahead of us, and they endured in it. They walked well in it. It's the same call upon us. And what did they know? Here's what they knew. Look at this scripture from chapter 11. And without faith, without what everybody? Faith. It's impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he exists. See, you come to God, you must believe that he exists and that he rewards, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. In other words, this is a reminder for you. God rewards. What does God do? He rewards. Like God, God gives a rewarding life. It is in his design that you would pursue a rewarding life. And don't forget, God does reward, which requires a moment of pause. Is there any place, I just ask yourself, is there any place where you've quit persevering in faith? Where you've gotten caught up in uncertainty? All the uncertainty of this world and your world. And you're letting fear creep in. in any place where you're just tired of it. I'm just tired of it. And you get lax in faithfulness. Any place where you let discouragement and doubt creep in. And you're not standing tall. See. See. Persevering in faith is persevering in faithfulness. Like you say, well, what, what is this persevering in faith thing? Well, it's persevering in faithfulness. That is what stick to itiveness is. That's why I put that on the screen so you pause, you settle it in your head, you snap a picture, you say, okay, oh, I get this. this I, persevering in faith means persevering in faithfulness. This is the activity, faithfulness. This is what I do. Modeled even by, like Moses, Hebrews chapter 11. Just gives a sentence of his story, so to speak. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. His reward. His what? Reward. 
See, you endure and persevere on the path of faithfulness no matter how hard, how weary, how tired, how unpopular, how mundane, difficult, boring, how repetitive. I mean, you just stay in the right things and the will and the wisdom of God because you know that on the other end is the reward. You, you, you endure and God compels us to, because that's part of faith. But you know, I, it is like us to say, I, you probably said it, I have, I've heard people say it. Ah, you know what? I'm just tired of it. Just tired of it. I'm going to take the easy way. The what way? Couldn't hear you. The what way? Ah, I just couldn't take the easy way. Hang on. Is the easy way the easy way? Come on. I grew up in a family who took the easy way and it became a hard life. In my 20s, I internalized a particular thought or quote along the line that there are two types of pain in this world. The short-term pain of discipline and the long-term pain of regret. Choose your pain. I internalize that. That's when I began to acknowledge and learn. It, it, the quote is from Jim Rohn. It, it, I, I, I don't know if it's fully his, but, but we must all suffer from one of two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference is discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. In other words, it's all hard. It's both hard. But hang on. Discipline is hard on the front end, and it rewards. Easy is easy on the front end. And then it becomes hard. A friend of mine, didn't even know what I was teaching a couple weeks ago, sent me a, a video um, of this guy, Marcus, who is doing a motivational moment around this thought, around this quote. And, and it captivated me. I'm, I'm just going to play 90 seconds. Now, this is very motivational. It ramps up. It gets energy. It, get, it gets passion. He gets fire. You can go right along with it. So, he, so it's, it's got that intensity to it. But it's just true of life and true of Hebrews 11. Listen in. It's hard to practice perseverance. It's hard to practice compassion and forgiveness. It's hard to set personal goals. It's hard to take care of yourself. It's hard to be broke. It's hard to live in bitterness and unforgiveness. It's difficult to be jealous of somebody. It's hard to let yourself go. It can be difficult to lay your life down and humble yourself and rid yourself of the disease of ego, pride, and comparison, and competition. It's, it's difficult. It's hard to be creative. It's hard to be an introvert. It's hard to be an extrovert. Singleness can be difficult. Marriage can be difficult. Raising your children on your own can be difficult. It's hard to wake up early. It's hard to wake up late. But there's a reward on the other side of waking up early. I want the pain of finishing something. I want the pain of persevering. Give me the pain of forgiving my haters. Give me the pain of forgiving people that tried to kill me. Give me the pain of letting it go. Give me the pain of growth. Give me the pain of acquiring new skill sets and talents. Give me the pain of managing my time well. Give me the pain of waking up early. Give me the pain of praying when I didn't feel like it. Forgiving when I didn't feel like it. Letting go. Give me the pain. I'll take that pain because on the other side of that pain, there is a reward. Woo! I mean, come on. I mean, sometimes I have, to, I have to talk myself into doing the right thing consistently. How many of you have to talk to yourself? Just make yourself do it. I'm like, I got to talk myself. I mean, I need to hear that occasionally. Because I know how you get a rewarding life is stick to I, I know I'm going to have to persevere, which means persevere in faithfulness. Because listen, Every rewarding thing in life has seasons of hard. Amen? It's on all of us. And the rewarding life demands faithfulness, stick to itiveness. And so these two weeks, week one, week two, with Easter in the middle, are going to look like this. Here's where we're going to go. 
Here's kind of the teaching layout today. I want to teach a couple of things. Stick to sovereignty as certainty. I want you to understand sovereignty. We're going to do a little brief theology, and then I want to unpack it because sovereignty is certainty. There are things that are certain. This is what God rewards. When you are faithful, when you stick to his sovereignty as certainty. Secondly, stick to sovereignty in the mundane. He rewards. That's what we're doing today. That's the remainder of our time. Then we're going to all celebrate Easter together, and I'm coming back, and I'm going right back into Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm going to deal the second half of Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to talk about stick to sovereignty and setbacks. Stick to sovereignty and suffering, because everything doesn't go your way. And when things fall apart, how do you remain faithful? It's a fair conversation. We should have the whole conversation. But let's get to the top of the list. Stick to sovereignty as certainty. This is what God rewards. In other words, you stick to sovereignty because you know the, this God, this sovereign God, is certain. Which means we tend to, how do I say? We, twi- we tend to quit things when we're not certain. When we're uncertain, we, we tend to be cautious and tentative. Like, I grew up in Michigan, and so, you know, the lake would freeze over, the, 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 the lakes where we live, and, and we go ice fishing. But, but if we didn't know how, how thick it was, we, it would be thin ice. What kind of ice? Thin ice. And we go all like this, and really cautious, really careful, because we weren't certain. Hey, faith is not thin ice. God is certain, because God is sovereign. See, when you get into Hebrews chapter 11, here's where it takes you. Now faith. This is how chapter 11 starts. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Hang on. Here's what faith is. Faith fills the gap. It's confidence. It's assurance. It's certainty. In other words, all that God has revealed about himself takes you right up to the edge of what you can see and stand on, and it's solid. And you can see from creation that God put this all together. There is a creator's hand behind all this. It didn't just happen. And so to move from, from all that God has told us to the place of faith, that right is a leap of faith. That leap is a leap of faith. And so it kind of bridges. Faith in itself creates the bridge. And you know of certainty what is true about him. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. You see, he's declaring that God is sovereign. God is what, everybody? Sovereign, which means God created all things. He was never created. He has always existed. He has pre-existed, will always exist, and he is preeminent. Get these words in your head. He is preeminent over all things. He is self-sufficient, self-sustaining, all-knowing, everywhere present. He created time, but he is outside of time and over time. His will is certain. What he declares will happen. And listen, you do not make this true because you take a leap of faith and believe in God, and you don't make it untrue because you take a leap of faith and don't believe in God. Your unbelief does not undo God, and your belief does not create God. God already exists. He is sovereign over all things. It's just that I need to take a shorter leap. I, I, I need a shorter leap. Like for me... To not, after all, you see all creation. He said, oh, I believe in evolution and there was no God's hand. I'm I'm not going after you right now. I'm just telling you this. I've tested it. I've looked at it. I've I've done enough study. I see the little bones and the way we put it together and we say this is the original Lucy and this is where everything created. You believe things out of nothing have something big bang. Pick whatever you want. That leap of faith is so far because listen, listen, if you don't believe in God, you have huge faith. It takes faith to deny God. It takes faith to believe God. I just need a shorter leap. Faith is certain. He's created. Listen, he he not only created it, he demonstrates his sovereignty by prophecy. See, today is what is called in the church the triumphal entry uh, entry of Christ, where Christ came down Mount of Olives on the coal or, or, or on the donkey, the full, and, and, and when he did, he declared, yes, I am king. I am the becoming Messiah. And everyone laid out palm branches, and, and, and they acknowledged, and they celebrated Jesus. 
Now, the reason that didn't last long is because they were celebrating the Jesus they wanted him to be. A whole bunch of us have faith in God as long as he does what we want him to do, which is not really faith in God. It's just demanding that God get on our agenda. But real faith in God surrenders because he is sovereign. And Matthew tells us that what happened on this day, commemorated on this day, the triumphal entry of Christ, is the fulfillment of prophecy written hundreds of years before. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, it was prophesied so that when it happened, you'd say, oh, God is sovereign. See, mankind makes all sorts of decisions in between, but God assures that whatever he says, he declares in time it is fulfilled. That's what happened with the cross of Christ on Easter. All these prophecies that were written hundreds of years before, then uniquely and detailed, fulfilled by Christ. And yet mankind exercised their will the whole time. The scribes and the Pharisees said, I'll exercise my will. We'll crucify him. We don't like him. Pilate says, I'm going to wash my hands and I'll exercise my will. Don't you know I have the authority of life and death to hold over you, Jesus? And Jesus wouldn't speak. He said, you have no authority apart from my Father in heaven. What is that? Sovereignty. And then they thought they got rid of Jesus and he rose from the dead. Talk about messing up somebody's plans. Because he's sovereign. So you got to settle his sovereignty because that's the clarity for all your certainty in life. Just because you're uncertain doesn't mean God is uncertain. He's sovereign. So let me put it on the screen. Just a couple of statements for us to know. God is sovereign over all things. Amen? Amen? Now, God sovereignly chose to give mankind free will. And we have choices. Now we have limited choices. Our will does not step into or over or undo the will of God. And yet it's curious. We have the opportunity to make all sorts of decisions. And I want to give you a sense of how does the sovereignty of God and the free will of man exist, coexist in this world since God sovereignly gave us free will. Now, there's a picture that I kind of got painted for me back when I had kids, and it was really helpful to me when we started having kids. And, and I want to help you just see if I can get you to some thoughts on sovereignty. So I want to take something theological and give it a picture. And to help me, I'm going to have my granddaughter, Breland, come out. So would you all welcome Breland? Breland, my seven-year-old granddaughter. Come on out here, girl. Oh, that is such a sweet wave. Do it again so everybody can see it. Yeah. Hi, sweetheart. Uh, on the count of three, everybody say, hey, Breland, one, two, three. Hey. Don't you feel welcome? Come on over here, sweetheart. Now, what we're about to do, folks, is we're going to get in the playroom. The what room? Playroom. All kids love the playroom. You can have a seat here, sweetheart. Now, we talked about this, that we were going to come in the playroom, and everybody loves the playroom. I, I get that we love the playroom. In fact, we have, we have G.I. Joe. When I was a kid and I was playing this, we, we had G.I. Joe. We got, we got G.I. Joe here, kind of the original. We got uh, Transformers here. Anybody have memories of Transformers or G.I. Joe? How about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Barbies? What are you a fan of? In fact, li listen, you, you just on the count of three, loud and proud, tell your neighbor, what is the toys you remember playing with? You pick your age and stage on the count of three, everywhere, loud yell, what is the toy? It could be Legos, whatever it is. You ready? One, two, three. Yeah. What's yours? Barbies. What do you like? You like what? Barbie. Yeah. Barbie it is. And, and you and I were talking, and I said, well, would you come out and, and, and we can play together? And, and uh, you can play, well, what did you want to play? I wanted to play school. Okay. And what are you going to be? The teacher. Oh, okay. And, and who do we have here? Which who is one? this one? This? Yeah. Is this, this teacher, teacher Barbie? Barbie? Yeah, how do you know it's teacher Barbie? What does she have on her dress? ABC letters. Oh, oh, that's, that's really awesome. You made me buy that this week. So <laughs> that's what papas do. And, and, and you, so you're now going to take us into, into um, teaching. I'm going to just make sure that everybody sets up. As, do we have to like face you? This is falling. 
we have to face you for teaching, right? G.I. Joe doesn't love it, um, but he's going to do it. And these guys, okay, these teenage mutant turtles, turtles are annoying. They won't cooperate. We're going to put them in the back and set them. Okay, now you can teach us, all right? Everybody say, Bree, teach us. Okay, let's teach us, sweetheart. You teach all our friends. We're going to play right here. You teach all the friends. Okay, what are, we getting, what are you going to teach us today? We're going to teach you. Wait, I'm going to teach you math. Oh. Oh, okay. That's hard. How do we how, how, teach it? Go ahead. Teach us something, and, and all the characters are going to listen. G.I. Joe, he's going to be my guy. Okay. Two plus two. Oh. <laughs> how, do, how do I do that? So, put... Two fingers on one hand and two on the other. Uh, Joe, Joe's, okay, I can't get, let's just pretend. Okay. Let's pretend that Joe, because we're in our world. Leave us alone, okay? <laughs> we're, we're, okay, Joe's got two here and two there. Come on, everybody. Two here, okay. Now, now what? Now you have to count all of them. Oh, this is not Joe's best thing. Uh, okay, just Count them together. All right, everybody, let's count them together. Ready? One, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> four. Is that good? Yeah. Is that the answer? Yeah. We did it. Yay. <laughs> Joe did it. Oh, fantastic. Okay, now, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just keep playing here in the playroom, okay? And Papa's going to go over there and have a little conversation with everybody else, okay? Is that all right? All right, so you play here. Now, what we all know as adults is that we have playrooms for our kids, and they get all their toys, and what they get to do in their world is they get, they get to create a play world. And in this world, they're sovereign. They're what? Sovereign. Their will is done in the play world. Fantastic. They love. But what we know as adults is that is not the real world, the real world is ours. It's not the playroom, it's the living room. We're all over here. See, we recognize, the kids don't recognize what it actually takes to produce a house. See, we have a house, and we have a job, and we have responsibilities, and we have demands, and we provide, and they don't know the pressure of a job, and the pressure of providing, and groceries, and details, and demands, and we have an entire world. And while they're making decisions over in the play world, those decisions where they're sovereign does not make the decisions in the living room. In fact, actually, the difficulty of parenting is that they often leave the playroom and want to make all the decisions, right? They bring it right over here. In truth, to understand sovereignty is to understand that God lives in a way bigger world than we live in. That God lives in the spirit world from which he created all material things, including us. And he gave us a will. And it's not intended to be condescending. But we're more in the playroom. Setting our will. Playing by how we want. But our sovereignty does not unseat the sovereignty of God. He's overall preeminent. Equally, the goal is that we would grow up from the playroom and join our father in the living room and have our will cooperate with his will so that we would be faithful to the things of God and God can fully reward us and we can be a part of bringing about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And part of the design is the recognition that many times when we get in the play world and we say we have faith in God and then God doesn't cooperate with our will, we get mad at God and we quit exercising faith because God didn't do what we wanted. See, all this comes into the conversation in Hebrews chapter 11. Would you help me thank Breland for doing a great job of being with us, helping us in the playroom. Sweetheart, you can go see your daddy. Thank you. Great job as always. Man, that girl has got talent borrowed from her papa. <laughs> see, God is helping us to understand that if we would just acknowledge that we have a God who is sovereign over all, and that his sovereignty of certain is certain, here's the point, then all my confidence and all my comfort is in the sovereignty of God. See, I live in an uncertain world, but I don't live uncertain because all my faith is in the certain God for whom all things are certain, and therefore I walk faithfully with 
him. So I build my life around the wisdom of God, around the will of God, but by faith, I stick to the things that are wise, good, smart, right, holy, pleasing to God, that build by his wisdom toward the things he has already said would be a rewarding life. Even when I don't feel like it, even when it's hard, even when it's unpopular, even when I feel persecuted, even when it's boring, even when it's mundane, even when it's boring, even when it's mundane, even when it's boring, <laughs> even when it's what? Okay. Which takes us to the second point. Stick to sovereignty in the mundane. <sighs> I was in my early 30s. It was the decade from my early 30s to early 40s that I saw it. And it reshaped my life, honestly. What did I see? I saw that a good bit of Hebrews chapter 11 was going to require me to be faithful in mundane things. Just seemingly mundane things. And I don't like mundane things. Mundane things to me are like they're just so weak. I know people make a big deal out of keep doing those mundane things. And they, yeah, but you know what? Uh, I know they're as big as a piece of paper, but they feel weak and, and like, like nothing, like, a, like a, a thin piece of paper. Here, let me illustrate. All right, come on up. You're right here. Just go right here in the middle. So everybody can see you. All right, let's put it, let's put it right here. Okay, here you go. Thin, thin piece of paper. Ready? Um, I want to see if you can rip that in half. Just put everything you got. Take that piece of paper and see if you can rip it in half. Do it. Come on. Come on. Wow. Give it up. Come on. That was fantastic. Thanks, my friend. See, isn't that great? He just demonstrated how weak this stuff really is. So who cares? Mundane. It's so... Thin. You know what? A piece of paper is only 0 .004 inches thick. So whatever. Who cares? It's, it's not that big. It's not that big a deal. It doesn't really accomplish much. So it's hard, so hard to do the mundane things faithfully. I just really don't want to stick to it because it's only paper thin. And, and because it's paper thin, like whatever. One day, I didn't feel like doing the mundane thing. And I took out a piece of paper and I went through the same exercise we just did. But this time I took it and I laid it on my desk. And I said, today, every time I need to do a mundane thing, I'm going to take out a sheet of paper and lay it down. Because that's what it feels like to me. And that particular day, I did it again. I did a, another mundane thing. It's, you know, I did another mundane thing. I did a, another mundane thing. I mean, the mundane thing. You know, like, yeah, you set your alarm and you get up in the morning exactly when you're supposed to. And then you go to work and you show up just before you're supposed to. So you're on time. And then you get disciplined and you get right at your work. And, and you're not on the phone and you're not looking at, at, at stuff you don't need to look at to distract you. And you just keep adding to it. And, and, and then I would just stay disciplined and, and, and do the most important stuff first and then the, and I wouldn't let myself escape or my mind drift and hey, it's having your time with God it's honoring God with first fruits it's it, it's, it's it's how you treat other people I mean and and I, you keep doing this and you end up getting like okay after that day it kind of stacks you get four five six here let's try this come on up here right back to where we were come on get you right in the middle get cheer them on cheer them on come on yeah see if you can rip that come on just like that just yeah. Go sit down. You're not helpful. Okay, so it doesn't matter that you do it uh, uh, all day. So, okay, I'll agree it doesn't matter. In fact, I'll just concede that for me, mundane is so hard. Anyone? Any? Okay, let's, let me help you. I like teaching on Sunday, game day, more than the 10 to 20 hours of study, prayer, Outlines and manuscripts. See, I like game day more than practice. I 
I like graduation day more than class day. I like payday more than work day. I, I like fitness more than working out. I like spending money more than saving money. I like setting a budget more than keeping a budget. I like a clean house more than cleaning the house. I like eating a meal more than making a meal. I like the trophy at the top of the mountain more than the climb up. I like making babies more than raising babies. I, I, I like having kids in bed more than the process of getting them in bed. I like driving a car more than maintaining a car. See, I like the rewards of faith more than the rules of faithfulness. Can I get an amen? Yeah. The thing is, it is those details in the mundane lane that are the magic, come on, put it on the screen, that are the magic for reams of reward. The mundane is the magic for the reams of reward. See, when I, on this particular day, will keep doing the mundane things I've just admitted I don't feel like doing, and I just keep adding that sheet, you know what eventually happens? If you'll do that every day, and then you'll do that every week, and then you'll do that every month, you know what happens? It starts stacking up until you end up with a ream of paper. Listen, men and women, let's give that a shot. Come here, my friend. Get on up here. Get you right here in the middle. Cheer them on. Can't rip the paper straight. You got just, as it is, rip that ream in there. No, come on, man. Put something. Come on, look at what you got there. Come on. I never had that. Give it one more shot. Cheer them. Cheer them. Cheer them. Cheer them. Woo! Ream of paper wins. All right. Thank you, my man. You see, men and women, here's what is true. You keep doing it year after year faithfully, and faithful builds up to a ream. And you keep doing it, and you get a year and two years and three years and four years and five years and six years, and you get the size of what Bruce is rolling out here on stage. See, what you really get is you get reams of reward. Look at it on screen. The mundane lane is the magic for reams. For what? reams of reward and pretty soon your life looks like this and you're not going to get through that you're not going to tear that up you're not going to tear it down you're not going to knock it down this right here becomes a solid life I mean there is a reward for faithfully doing the things that matter all the mundane adds up we see someone with strength of faith and strength of prayer and strength of having consistently walked in the will of God and chasing God. The strength that they build in and doing all of the mundane stuff in marriage and family and work and career and finance and discipline. And they honor God with first fruits and they don't evaluate that. And their family shows up and worships every week together in the body of Christ. And they don't evaluate that every week. Yeah, they miss when they're out of town, but, but they watch online. Like, I mean, like they, they take the things that God instructs and they say, I'm putting that in my life. And you end up with this life. And here's what the world says. Here's what you've said. You see that life and you go, oh, they have it easy. They have it what? And that's the lie. Oh, oh, oh. that's the lie. That's the what? I can't hear you. That's the what? That's the lie that they have it easy. The truth is, they've been doing hard for a long time. See, when God calls us to persevere, he says, be faithful one sheet at a time. Because in that faithfulness, to the one who rewards, you're confident he'll reward those who diligently seek him. Amen? It's who God is. It's, 
It is why that the author in Hebrews 11 wrote this about all these people who had faith. Who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Whew! Wow, I want that life. How do you get it? Hey, persevere. Stick to it. Now, does this mean that if you stick to everything in your life feels awesome at all seasons of life? I mean, how do you remain faithful when things are falling apart? That's where we pick up in a couple of weeks. But for now, for now, campus pastors are going to step up and let me give you a couple things. As they do, we're going to pray. Maybe today you thank God. Hear me. You thank God. God, thank you that you are sovereign and your plan is certain. And maybe you ask God. God, what sheets of paper need to be stacked with fresh faithfulness? Amen. So God, first, we just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you that you're sovereign. Thank you that you are all-knowing that you are so wise, <laughs> that you know every answer, that you've never failed, that your wisdom is beyond our comprehension, and that you work for the good of those who love you. So God, we don't have to fear, we don't have to worry, we know that you are in control, regardless of what is happening in our life, but at the same time, God, we have a responsibility so God, I pray that you would give clarity of mind. God, that you would, you would wake us up to the papers in our life that we need to stack. <laughs> Maybe it is in our marriage or our parenting. Maybe it's in our character. Maybe one good decision would lead to another good decision. And, and before we know it, we have a, a journey of life that we're proud of. God, and give us the courage. Give us the strength. God, knowing what to do and doing the right thing are two different things, and we need your help. So God, would you give us the courage? God, would you give us the strength to stick to the things that are just a little mundane, a little of what we think would be non-consequential, but they are to you. They're a big deal to you. So God, we want to honor you, be faithful, Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Man, what a good day. Focus towards Easter. Next time we'll see each other is Easter, Thursday, Saturday, or Sunday. Pick a service that's right for you, or better yet, pick the service that is best for the person that you're inviting. You'll see parents as you head out today. Your kiddos are gonna give you a box. It looks like this. It's a Holy Week box. It's something that your, your family can do together as you prepare for Easter. So we'll see you for that. For God is good. And all the time, God is good. Have a good week. Well. Well. We did it. Man, For the, where are you guys at? Oh, there they are. <laughs> Gosh. Hey, thanks for being Moving with us around. today. Yeah. Um, I love the conversation about toys. Okay. And when you were a kid. Yes. G.I. Joe? No. Barbie. I wasn't that boy enough for uh, G.I. Joe. Oh. I was definitely Legos. Oh, okay. Creative. Uh, Have you ever stepped on a Lego? I don't think I've ever been called creative. Yes, it's terrible. It's terrifying. The worst. Yeah. Hey, online, thanks you so Wait, much. What? what? What was your toy? Oh, I don't know. Probably I had something a, like I loved, well, problem I had like solving. A, exactly. No, I had a um, a fire truck and like three of them. Okay. And we would go in the woods and put out fires. That's cool. That's what we did. All right, moving on. <laughs> yeah, moving on. Hey, in the comments, put what your favorite toy was growing up and uh, we'd love to interact with that yeah hey thanks for joining us online as you know easter is coming up this weekend and we're going live online hey. at five o'clock so um five o'clock on saturday saturday and then 
Sunday, 9-11, live, so yeah. um, be here for that. Yeah, Oh, absolutely. if you're in the area. Yeah, if you're in the area, like, come by to a campus. We've got nine campuses, nine campuses. And, cool. and, and listen, if, if Lawrenceville is in your driving distance and you come to Lawrenceville, like, we're here at the end of the service, like, doing our thing, come meet us. Like, you'll, give them five, you'll give them five bucks, right? I'll give you five bucks. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Of Monopoly money, which I used to play as a kid. Oh, there you go. See uh, that callback? <laughs> it happens. Hey, a couple questions. If you're with family or your home gathering, a couple things you can um, have a conversation conversation around. It's very important to do that and unpack this stuff. So many things to think about. Number one, what's your main takeaway from the teaching? And number two, what are you going to do this week to keep those habits going and moving? Yeah, so that's good. Love the idea. Yeah. Love you guys. We'll see you at Easter. Bye.